one meeting in particular uh, that took place where during the election, uh, towards the end of it, when it was really clear that uh, these uh, stories, um, false stories about, you know, uh, you know, saying things about Hillary that weren't true or stories, you know, pumping up Trump when it wasn't true, the Pope endorsing Trump, things like that. Um, this stuff, you know, we call them fake news, uh, was circulating on Facebook and they had to decide whether to try to stop it or not. And they decided not to. And arguing against it was, you know, uh, particularly uh, the head of their D.C. office, who was a Republican, who some people in that office felt was, you know, really representing the Republicans more than he was representing Facebook's usership. Um, and he decided uh, to let that stuff go on, even though it helped Trump much more than um, uh, Hillary. And, um, and you know, it, it, it damaged her, but he felt that he didn't want to, he argued that let's, we shouldn't tilt the playing field when the fact was that the playing field was being tilted by Facebook towards Trump. So, you know, removing that stuff would have leveled the playing field. This time on the Plutopia podcast, Wired Editor-at-Large Stephen Levy joins John and Scoop in the virtual studio to discuss Facebook, the inside story. Levy's book explores the early history of Facebook and its recent problems. Welcome to the Plutopia podcast. Today we'll be talking to, Scoop and I, we'll be talking to Stephen Levy, who is an editor at large for Wired Magazine. He's also an author and journalist, and he's written several books on computers, uh, technology, cryptography, the great book Crypto, uh, the internet, cybersecurity, privacy, and Artificial Life, which was some time ago. His latest book is Facebook, The Inside Story. Hey, Stephen, glad you could join hey, us. Thank you, good, good to connect with you. So I'm wondering how long you spent working on this book, like all the interviews and research and the writing itself. Yeah, it took over three years uh, to finish the the book and get the manuscript in. I started it in 2016 um, and actually got the idea for writing it. I couldn't even pinpoint the date. I think it was August 27th, 2015. And that was when Mark Zuckerberg announced that uh, a billion people had been on Facebook in the last 24 hours. And I realized, wow, that, that had never happened. That's such a substantial part of the whole population of the world the same okay. network on the same day and it took me about a year to uh convince facebook to give me the access i wanted and you know get the contract done and, and get going there so literally a year after that almost to the day i was starting my research and going to uh nigeria with zuckerberg so your last book was about google and you were pretty well embedded with them did you get uh, pretty much the same kind of access with Facebook that you got with Google? It was the same standard deal where they would give me access to people there and, you know, no strings attached from my end. I didn't have to show it to them. They had no approval. They didn't see it until, you know, I gave them a finished book, um, you know, you know, a week or two before uh, it hit the, the bookstores. Um, uh, and, uh, I think I got a little less access to some of the like big meetings, you know, with, with, with Google, they let me go to product reviews and uh, the big meeting of executives and uh, uh, Facebook wasn't quite that open, um, but I got pretty candid with the executives and, and I was able to talk to people, um, you know, sort of off the campus, let's say, um, or former employees to fill in what they didn't give me. Do you think the uh, reason for that might be that this was at a time when they were under a lot of pressure because of you know various problems that uh, had been created by uh, Facebook's uh, data uh, exchanges and various uh, privacy issues? I think I might have had something to do with it. Um, uh, I think in just in general, um, they're a little more of a closed company uh, that you know, Google just by nature was a little more open than, than Facebook. They're, they 
the book um, embraces openness and some things like how the data centers work and other things, but in other ways, it's um, uh, a company where things are pretty well uh, not shared in, in, in general with the public. They're very careful about that. And um, so I, I was lucky just to get enough access, you know, or to get enough access uh, where I could paint that whole picture. Um, whereas, you know, my experience beforehand was, you know, they would give you what you needed to do your story, but to really uh, get a full 360 degree understanding of the company uh, would have been impossible without that uh, ability to interview whoever I wanted and then go back and interview them again and, you know, uh, do a reality check with someone outside the company. and. And you know, having someone leave the company and then give you a different interview. So, uh, it it really was more the nature of Facebook than the circumstances they were going under. Well, given what all was going on over that three-year period, it seems like it was kind of a moving target. Uh, was it a pretty sort of nonlinear process putting the book together? Well, I mean, totally. And what happened was that uh, it was going to be one book kind of book before the election and after the election just as things turned drastically for facebook uh, my book changed uh, beforehand uh it was going to be pretty much i would have to make these decisions like what's going to be the narrative arc of the book uh for my google book which i'd done before i decided that the moral dilemma of google was its immersion in china and they did this search engine that, you know, uh, cooperated with the Chinese government and censorship. And, you know, and, and that really violated the values of the company and the founders. And, you know, it, it really was a moral shortcoming. And I talked about how they dealt with it and how that the, the path led to them, uh, you know, withdrawing from China. Um, and that it didn't have to be that way. I could have picked other things, but uh, that's what I picked. But after the Facebook ran into its troubles, there really was only one way to write this book, and that was to tell the story of Facebook and how things had led up to all the problems that Facebook had, because they were pretty much all of their own making. Um, and, you know, the, I think it was Chekhov said that, you know, when you have a play in Act One, if there's a gun, uh, it's got to go off in Act Three. So I was in Act Three writing about Facebook and covering it in real time and seeing all these guns. So my job really was to go back in history and see when those guns were planted. Yeah, and in the historical part, you know, kind of my assumption about Zuckerberg had always been uh, that he had stumbled into Facebook, that it was kind of a happy accident. But from your book, it's really clear to me that uh, I didn't really understand him very well and that uh, he was a, a really – ambitious guy with a vision from the very beginning and that he was really pushing this thing forward. Uh, am I, is that an accurate assumption? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, you know, when it, of course, when they first started in 2004 and they were still at, at Harvard in the dorm room, you know, he didn't have those big visions. But uh, after he went to Silicon Valley and got funded and really was exposed to people who had been thinking about you know, waiting to see which social network was going to be the one that exploded. You know, and that, you know, some, one of his first funders was Reed Hoffman, um, who was a, a big uh, a thought leader about social uh, networking. And, you know, he started LinkedIn, of course. And, you know, there was Mark Pincus, who had started a, a social network called Tribe. Tribe. Yeah. And those, those two were, you know, they invested at the same time that Peter Thiel did. Uh, and he was a lead investor. Uh, uh, so he was surrounded by these people with big ideas. And uh, he had ideas of his own. And what I found that in 2006, which I found to be the real pivotal year of Facebook in terms of setting its course, um, Zuckerberg had laid out his grand plans in a, in a notebook, you know, and uh, which he later destroyed. Uh, but I was man managed to get hold of some uh, existing copies of that notebook. Uh, which was really striking to see how he was planning that vision for Facebook to be a, this company would have information on everyone in the world uh, back then in 2006. Do you think his uh, or Facebook's problems were partially due to 
Zuckerberg's extreme ambition combined with uh, not much previous experience? Well, um, definitely part of his ambition, and, and I think the lack of experience came into it, but it was more the hurry, you know, to fulfill that vision and the idea that you had to grow really, really rapidly um, at the cost of being deliberate in avoiding consequences uh, of, of, of what you did. And I think that his thinking was shaped on uh, the idea of the first few years of Facebook when it was a campus network uh, that the consequences, how, how serious could they be really? I mean, someone, you know, uh, some nasty things might come out um, about something someone did at a party or your relationship status might come out. And, uh, but the stakes weren't as high as they were when you were going into a company like a country like Myanmar, um, where it wasn't used to uh, digital, you know, uh, you know, didn't have any sense of digital literacy. Um, uh, it was using the internet for the first time and could easily be exploited by uh, authoritarians or to even promote genocide. And, uh, but uh, Facebook didn't, you know, take account of that. They just went in there, um, even when people uh, at Facebook, no one at Facebook could speak Burmese. Um, and, you know, then were slow to react when there were problems were reported. Well, I think there's a kind of techno, techno utopian trajectory that a lot of us followed and that he seems to have been following where, you know, you get wonderful ideas about bringing people together and giving them an opportunity to share with each other. Uh, and, you know, where you have community and where you have that sort of sharing, there's data flowing all over the place inherently. And little thought was given initially to the implications of having all that data moving over a network. Well, I think you're, you're right that there was this utopian aspect to the idea of connecting everyone in the world, but I don't buy it as an excuse for not being deliberate about uh, avoiding the consequences, not looking ahead to see what the consequences of what you released were. When you're dealing with a product with hundreds of millions and then billions of people, um, you have to be cognizant of the impact of what you do. They recruited people saying, hey, you're going to have a huge impact on the world. Um, so you can't do that and pretend that the dark side of the world doesn't exist and won't be woken up by your giving people the power to connect to anyone else in the, in the, in the world or, you know, to, or to spread a meme, even a harmful one, um, virally you know, to millions and millions of people. So I feel that for too long, Facebook used that as, a, that as an excuse. When you attended these meetings, this was right about the time when the pressure was on about all of the manipulation of uh, data for uh, well, for the benefit of uh, Donald Trump and uh, and the Russians, did that surface in those meetings that you were able to attend? Was it a, really a big subject at that time? No, well, they didn't let me into the meetings where they would discuss that. Uh, uh, I, I I guess the closest I came, I went to some meeting a meeting of um, sort of the content rules, um, you know, how they should be changed. But the you know, but I was able to report on the meetings um, that took place there by getting accounts of people who were there, you know, or knew of what was going on in the room, um, you know. And there was you know one meeting in particular uh, that took place where during the election, uh, towards the end of it, when it was really clear that uh, these uh, stories, um, false stories about you know, uh, you know saying things about Hillary that weren't true or stories, you know, pumping up Trump when it wasn't true, the Pope endorsing Trump, things like that. Um, this stuff, you know, we call them fake news, uh, was circulating on Facebook and they had to decide whether to try to stop it or not. And they decided not to. And arguing against it was, you know, uh, particularly uh, the head of their D.C. office, who was a Republican, who some people in that office felt was, you know, 
really representing the Republicans more than he was representing Facebook's usership. Um, and he decided uh, to let that stuff go on, even though it helped Trump much more than um, uh, Hillary. And, um, and you know, it, it, it damaged her, but he felt that he didn't want to, he argued that let's, we shouldn't tilt the playing field when the fact was that the playing field was being tilted by Facebook towards Trump. So, you know, removing that stuff would have leveled the playing field. Some of that stuff, uh, obviously, there's this whole Cambridge Analytica thing, and it sounds like the Cambridge Analytica data gathering, I mean, you tell the whole story there, and it's a lot more complex than just reaching in and grabbing the data. Uh, and it sounds like this was sort of like happening and percolating along uh, so far below the executive watch that they weren't at all aware of it and uh and that it just went way too far before they even had any sense that it was happening well in one sense that was true in terms of you know that they didn't you know it, it, the particular um you know uh data grab which was passed on the cambridge analytica uh was below their radar but not you know, unknown to them, really, because, you know, what I figured out, and I do tell the whole story of the Cambridge Analytica, that data and how it happened, who the researcher was, um, who Cambridge Analytica was, and how, you know, each step of the way, I tell that story um, as a story, which hadn't really been done before. But um, I figured out the Cambridge Analytica actually happened in 2010. And it wasn't something that happened beneath the executive radar. It was something that was the official Facebook policy on what data they would give away to software developers who were writing applications that ran on top of uh, the Facebook platform. So they decided in 2010 um, to increase the amount of information they were giving. And this is information they gave away, you know, really just all you do is sign up and say you're a developer. Um, and, you know, uh, so when you did an app or even just did a survey, which was considered the same as, you know, putting an app on uh, the platform, uh, they would uh, uh, give away not only the information of a user who signed up for the app. So if you took a survey, they'd say, um, okay, you're taking the survey. Do you want to, you know, click off this terms of service? And you'd click it off and you probably wouldn't read it, but it gave all your data to the uh, company that offer you the survey, but it would also give the data of all your friends who have no idea this was happening. They had no sign off, um, but they would get that data too. And things like their likes, their relationship status, um, you know, the, uh, their geographic location, all sorts of things would go to that developer. And since each user of Facebook on average has 130 friends, uh, you don't need a lot of people to get a huge database. And that's exactly what happened uh, for this researcher in Cambridge University uh, who did a survey for research purposes. And, you know, uh, he paid a couple hundred thousand people, you know, at first through, um, you know, the uh, Amazon uh, system, you know, the Mechanical Turk system. Uh, and, you know, uh, and those people gave away the information to their friends. So he got a, a database of about 87 million people. Um, and that was perfectly legal with Facebook. As a matter of fact, Facebook even hired him as a consultant. He was on the campus uh, working with Facebook. Uh, so he was, you know, favored at, at, at Facebook and they, and they liked what he was doing. And it, it was like perfectly cool with them to get this database uh, of people's personal information where he violated their terms of service is when he sold it uh, or licensed it, you know, however way you want to say it, to this company that was working to help the far right, uh, first working for Ted Cruz and then Donald Trump. Um, so, uh, uh, but even then, when that happened and Facebook actually recognized there was a danger of this, uh, they didn't set up any systems to police it seriously. They didn't, they didn't do an audit trail. So, you know, this was something that uh, Facebook had been warned against by people working for them saying this is too much information. Yet they decided from the very top, Zuckerberg, that they were going to go ahead with it. Demographic data like you might get in a, a CRM or something like that. It's actual behavioral data, much more exactly. extensive, right? But for instance, likes. Now, likes are unbelievably revealing. Um, and there was a researcher, uh, also at Cambridge originally, um, who decided not to go along with Cambridge Analytica. Um, but he did a paper 
uh, with some other people that said, you know, with 15 likes, uh, you could know as much about a person as, you know, one of their casual acquaintances. And with 100 likes, you know as much about them as someone really close to them. Uh, with 300 likes, you know more about them than their spouse. We're talking right now about the Cambridge Analytica part of it, but there was also the Internet uh, Agency in Russia, and they were also doing something in support of Trump, but it was a separate thing, right? Yeah, yeah. There were basically three ways that Facebook failed on the election. Um, and the first was, we talked about it a bit, that fake news. Um, uh, the second, you know, and I actually think this was number one, was that, um, and, and Facebook's a little less to blame for this, uh, was that uh, how Trump used Facebook so much better than the Clinton campaign did. Um, uh, you know, they made their bet, the Trump uh, campaign, on Facebook and uh, took way more advantage of it than, than the Clinton people did, who didn't really take Facebook very seriously. Um, and Facebook offered both ca campaigns the opportunity to have Facebook specialists embedded in the campaign. Hillary said no. Trump said, bring it on. And um, interestingly, you know, those people were, you know, uh, died in the wool Republicans. They didn't want to have any, uh, the Trump campaign didn't want any Democrats in there. Um, and uh, they, you know, did things like, you know, uh, would take advantage of, of Facebook's ability to, you know, uh, hone ads and target them to individual people, targeting them on whatever their weak spots might be, would they be susceptible to? So, um, so they tested different ads in some days, in 24 hours, they might have 175 different thousand different ads sent out on the same day. Um, and they figured out that because they had so much information on people, um, what their weak spots were. Hey, is this person uh, susceptible to a pitch about immigration? Where this person is susceptible to pitch about abortion uh, or guns, and they would try to do that to see if that person could be tilted to Trump. And if they figured this person is not going to vote for Trump, and they were able to, able to figure out that from the information they had, then they would try to get that person uh, information that got them disgusted on the whole system. Um, and you know, so they might like send information to blacks, implying that Hillary didn't care about them, and um, and trying to get those people not to vote. Um, and, you know, this really came from uh, Facebook just having so much information and allowing such degree of micro targeting that uh, it became a toxic uh, feature of, of Facebook. And the third thing uh, is the Russians. So this is a foreign government coming in there and creating fake accounts and uh, trying to influence the election is something that Facebook fell short on. Um, they say, well, we weren't looking for this. We, but it, they realized later that this was something that could have been anticipated. Uh, again, it was a question of Facebook not stepping up to its role as you know, uh, the world's leading social network um, where they had to look out for these things. And only after they realized that the Russians were doing this did they understand that this was completely in keeping with the way that Russia has behaved in the past um, and is something they should have anticipated. Uh, but did. So they were trying to boost Trump and at the same time suppress Hillary votes. Yeah, 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 they were. Now, it's unclear how big an effect they had on the election, but the idea that they were working, um, you know, like a foreign government was working uh, using Facebook uh, is, uh, you know, is outrageous and, you know, and it shouldn't have happened on the platform. And Facebook was really slow to act against the Russians even to begin with. Um, they had a, a page called uh, DC Leaks that helped spread um, the information they got from hacking the DNC. And Facebook even was slow to take that down. They had to, you know, uh, try to figure out, you know, some loophole through their own rules of why to take it down. Um, and again, because, you know, they didn't want to offend the, the Republicans. Do you think the involvement of uh, a lot of venture capital in Facebook had a big influence on their failure to really take these issues seriously. Venture capital is usually quite conservative, uh, at least many of the funds are, so they may not have taken kindly to someone not being conservative with their money. 
Well, I think that by that point, Facebook was a public company. So that really, you know, the, the only people that had to answer were shareholders. But in Facebook's case, uh, Mark Zuckerberg holds uh, around 54%, I believe, of the voting stock. So even shareholders can't tell Mark Zuckerberg what to do. You know, it, it is a company where it isn't difficult to assign account accountability. It belongs to one person, and that's Zuckerberg. So early on, Zuckerberg would say, this is not about money, it's about community, or something to that effect. Does Do you think he still feels that way? I mean, uh, how does he feel about the widely held perception that his users are actually his products? Well, I think, you know, so for the first part of it, I feel that he, uh, and he's, he still says that, you know, money is not what motivates me. And I feel that that is, you know, to some degree true. I mean, he's not, he's not doing it to compile the biggest fortune, but he is a person who's interested in uh, domination, let's say. And that was a word he used early in Facebook's history to end every meeting uh uh, I mean, all hands meeting at Facebook. He would end it. He'd just say domination, you know, in the spirit of, you know, his heroes um, when he went to, to uh, high school and college who were, you know, these, you know, uh, uh, people from, you know, the ancient Rome, um, like Julius Caesar you know, or, or Augustus Caesar. I'm sorry, Augustus Caesar, who was his hero and he loved Alexander the Great. Um, so domination is part of that. And, you know, uh, he's an intense competitor. Um, and so I think that that's part of that whole, you know, uh, motivation for what he's doing. Not so much money. And, um, you know, yeah, I, so I, also, I looked way back into his past, the way he was as a kid to get into his motivations. And, you know, I, I found that present even when he was a child. So Facebook's reputation now is somewhat tainted over some of these like privacy and other issues uh, and the, just the overall impression that it has exploited its users and failed to protect their privacy from marketing and political surveillance, both really. Um, so just from reading your book, I can have the sense that they're kind of internally conflicted. Overall, do you feel they're trying to do the right thing? Yeah, I don't think they're bad people, you know, believe it or not. I mean, you know, I, I, I've been critical here and I'm critical in the book. But I feel, you know, look, this is in the, con the larger context of the way capitalism works and the way the power, you know, power works in software, you know, the way, you know, it is a, largely a winner take all uh, you know, uh, field, you know, where it, it, it's it's. It, you go through these cycles where companies get incredible power and it really takes a you know, disruptive event like, you know, some uh, technology equivalent of the comet hitting uh, to wipe out the dinosaurs uh, for changes to come. And that happens a lot. It almost happened to Facebook when mobile came along. So um, I think that, you know, uh, so they're, they, they want to feel that they're doing the right thing. But, you know, they, they also feel that they want to survive um, through the next big change, whatever that is. Um, so, um, you know, I guess they you, you could ask them, how do you sleep at night? I think they sleep well because they feel they're trying to do the right thing. Um, but um, it when they had a crash in their reputation, they had to really reevaluate where they were. And I think they in their own evaluation, they feel. Um, they came out okay, okay. They made mistakes, but um, I, I'm not quite sure how deeply they understood, you know, how they uh, those mistakes, you know, made them go against some of their own principles. Cheryl Sandberg is uh, is sort of like there's two brains in the company, and you know, primarily you have Zuckerberg running the company and and his influence is pretty uh pretty much the influence that drives things but Sheryl Sandberg has uh has had quite a bit of power and influence in the company too how do you think uh her role in the company once she came on board uh affected the trajectory so well it did affect the trajectory she came in in 2008 <clears throat> 
And it was actually right after one of those um, disasters that came because Facebook moved too fast and Zuckerberg didn't take account of privacy for a product uh, called Beacon that reported what you bought on websites uh, uh, to your friends. It came up in your friend's newsfeed when you bought something on a website, um, which was crazy. Um, um, and it didn't really give you a, a sufficient chance to opt out of it. And, you know, when it should have, you know, people around them argued it should have been opt in. So she came in for a few things. One is to add some gravitas to the company um, and help uh, make the culture something that can grow to a much bigger company. And she did that pretty well, really. Um, and she came in to hone the business model and she was behind a lot of the, uh, the model as it is now, which is the massive use of data. Um, and basically her job was to do, and this was an arrangement that they had <clears throat> when she came on, all the stuff that Zuckerberg didn't want to do. So they split the company in a sense where Zuckerberg will be in charge of engineering and products and she would be pretty much in charge of everything else, the stuff he wasn't so much interested in, which was sales and, and um, lobbying in Washington and policy, uh, HR, um, and even security became part of her realm. And, you know, the general the security chief security officer reported to the general counsel who reported to the policy person who reported to her. So you had this person in charge of security who was like rungs away from Cheryl and never even had a one-on-one -on -one with Mark Zuckerberg. And that was a problem because by splitting the company like that, when the problems emerged in Cheryl's world, you know, uh, then they didn't get to Zuckerberg. And that's how they were allowed to get to the point where they wound up really damaging the company. Um, so I feel that that was something that uh, you know, Sandberg's natural tendency was not to bring problems to Zuckerberg until they had almost gotten out of hand. Uh, so at least in this case. So uh, that really led to part of why things got so bad uh, uh, before the election. Part of that sounds like it's just bureaucracy, really. It's just bureaucracy in a big company like that becomes an impediment. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, but Facebook tried really hard to avoid exactly those kind of bureaucratic problems. But that's really hard to do when you've got tens of thousands of employees and, you know, so many products going on. I get the feeling that a lot of Zuckerberg's uh, quest for fast implementation of everything may have uh, caused a problem with their rollouts of new code, new app, uh, new apps, and new functionality, because there were, have been countless problems where they say, oh, we've got to roll this back because uh, it caused this problem. And I have a feeling they have ignored uh, you know, serious quality assurance testing in favor of rushing it to the market. Well, I mean, that you know, early in the history that, you know, the DNA of that is, you know, their expression move fast and break things came from, you know, they were one of the first companies to really take advantage of these new web tools, which allowed you to really very quickly um, introduce new things. And when new engineers came on, um, one, you know, you didn't get your bones at Facebook until you put something into production um, and crashed the whole system. Um, and it was really easy to bring the whole system back up, but it, that was okay because move fast and break things became the motto. They felt figured if you didn't break things, you weren't moving fast enough. You weren't, you weren't, you know, um, uh, going, you know, being bold enough to do what it took to really grow Facebook. Um, and that motto, uh, became, you know, to, to go even beyond writing code into introducing new products. And so the idea was, you know, come out with stuff. Um, and if it had consequences, we'll apologize later. People will forgive you. I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. Um, uh, and thank you for, for um, your uh, intelligence, really, and, and your, uh, your great work in sort of gathering all of the information about Facebook and then sort of making it understandable uh the book is a great read um and a real page turner 
but I'd like to talk now about something you did more recently, uh, your interview with Larry Brilliant, mm -hmm. who, uh, among other things, I mean, he's done a lot of things. He was like a founder of SEVA Foundation, uh, which uh, really was focused on giving sight back to right. blind people throughout the world. Uh, but he also worked on the project to eradicate smallpox, and and his background is as an epidemiologist. He was also uh, the one, you know, of, he owned the well at one point. Yeah, I see that he he was a co-founder of the well. Yeah, yeah. and uh, um, uh, a big part of the whole Earth community. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is yeah. how I knew him. But um, in this interview that you did with him recently, he was talking specifically about COVID nineteen um how how did he describe the spread of COVID 19. well he he was very i mean look he you know uh early in his career he was he was involved in the effort to eradicate smallpox um so uh from you know he is a quite a you know like a veteran of these public health issues and um and really understands epidemiology uh and I, you know, when my book tour uh, ended rather precipitously, um, you know, I, I switched, switched back to, you know, uh, diving into this issue as all of us at Wired were doing. Um, uh, our editor, uh, Nick Thompson, um, uh, basically gathered us and said, this is the, this is the biggest story of your lives, you know, and, and we can do a service by, you uh, helping people understand what's going on and, you know, doing what we do journalism um, about this to illuminate things and um, dig up the things that, that other people weren't saying. And, uh, and I thought, well, what, what, what could I do? And uh, thought back to uh, Larry, who of course I knew from that, that world um, and specifically thought back to a 2006 Ted talk that he gave where he wanted, he was talking about how we could um, address pandemics and you know he wanted to set up an early warning system and as it turned out the thing that he had done with you know that ted prize that year you know actually helped uh identify you know or speed up the identification of coronavirus um and you know but you know obviously uh places could have acted faster on that um and we're in a cover situation so uh uh <clears throat> So I, I wanted to reach out to him and sort of get uh, from a human being who's knowledgeable, what sense of it that people should know. And, you know, to ask him the questions that people needed clarity on. He was able to give them in a very humane way. And that particular interview um, really took off. It was the second most read story in the history of Wired. Millions and millions of people read it and shared it um and you know we were really happy to be able to you know uh help larry you know communicate uh to the world you know uh some plain talk about what was going on and where we should go so this is something that uh he like many other epidemiologists foresaw and and uh you know it was just as they say a, a matter not of if but when um so he wasn't surprised at all to see this happen, right? No, he wasn't. But he was, uh, like a lot of people are, um, he was kind of outraged that the U.S. missed an opportunity to mitigate what was, what was, you know, you know, a, 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 an epidemic that was, you know, going to happen. But you know, we it didn't have to be. Uh, as bad as it's turning out to be. And, you know, and he referred to uh, Trump's you know, inaction, you know, and, and uh, you know, and basically belittling the threat as, you know, the, the worst behavior of a public official that he's seen in his lifetime. Oh, but Trump says he knew it was a pandemic before anybody said it was a pandemic. Well, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, but, sorry. But he knew it and kept it to himself, maybe. Uh, that's, that's even worse, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so we know this has been sort of like the response here has been sort of bungled. And that was the case in China, too, right? They could have done more earlier. Yeah, we're still learning really about 
what China, you know, uh, did or didn't do and what their numbers are or aren't. But I feel that's irrelevant. That, that's not an excuse. Or, you know, I mean, we're, you know, look, we have to hold our officials accountable to, to what they do with the information that they had. Sure, um, what we could have done here. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I think that when it comes to accountability, um, you know, you know, you could say, you know, I guess it's, it's us, meaning me, useful as a yardstick to say South Korea did this, you know, China did this, Italy did this, um, you know, but we have to rise and fall on what we did with what we knew. And, you know, and more to the point now, we have to make the right decisions now and be forceful about that now. And what's really alarming is that you don't see that happening even now. I found it uh, unusual that uh, we were caught off guard so badly, even while the Trump administration has been concentrating so much on homeland security. And if a uh, pandemic isn't uh, a threat to homeland security, I'm not sure what is because the impact is uh, definitely equal to at least a carelessly tossed uh, you know nuclear warhead well yeah i mean i think i mean that's why it's so important to hear from you know people who know what they're talking about like brilliant um because uh if we get that clarity we can make those uh decisions in the future about what national security is i don't think i saw it in your discussion but he did he uh have anything to say about balancing containment against the impact on the economy when we, we got specifically into that um you know in i guess you know that you know boy i'm trying to think what day we did that because the thing moved so much but um you know uh, i feel you know look that the priority that we should be giving, you know, and I think that was the context of our conversation of what we can do, you know, to get out of this and, the, you know, as the best way to bring back the economy. And he set up a roadmap for that of what needs to be done, you know, and he, you know, can, you know, cause in, in everyone's asking, when can we get back to quote normal? And he laid out several conditions. Um, and the first was to understand what the situation is. You know, the, you know the, the, he says, if we have this iceberg where most of the problem is beneath the surface, and we can't measure how big it is, you know, we're, we're blind and we're still in the iceberg. So, you know, uh, a couple of weeks after this interview, we have made no progress on that. And Trump said uh, just a couple of days ago that saying, you know, I haven't heard about testing in a couple of weeks. So, well, really, that's, that's actually the most important thing we should be doing. Um, and that's the thing that one would think that the government would be saying, you know, we're going to move mountains to make the testing happen. Instead, he's saying, I haven't heard much about this. It's, it's, I'm not, I don't, it's not a big deal for me. We, we're doing fine. Yeah, I've heard some people say that they think that the solution to the testing problem is going to come from private enterprise where they'll just. Create well, you, tests, can't, you, can't, like home you tests. can't do that. I mean, there's certain things that you that in a decentralized fashion you can address, you know. And then there's certain things that, in terms of mandating how certain areas should be tested, that the government has to step in. And you know, um, and to, and in a way, you want to be able to measure, you know, apples to apples instead of apples to oranges in terms of how one state does it compared to another. So I feel that uh, we're really being handicapped if we don't have some national coordination. Well, the problem with home testing seems to me, and that's one of the things they've been talking about, like home tests will be available and you can get the test and take the test, but there's no controlled way to take the statistic from that test and contribute it to the larger body of statistics so that you actually get a clearer picture. Well, I mean, the research that I've been doing recently and, and things I've been reading is, is I'm seeing a lot of efforts, you know, that are in part coming from industry to help in that. I think that, you know, but what the problem with this is that, you know, some of the 
you know, uh, where the tests might, you might be come up with the tests, um, the actual chemicals you need to do the test are going to be short in shortage. And again, that's the kind of thing where you need the clout of a big government to say, you know, hey, we're, we have to do what we need to do to get the, the chemicals, the materials, so we can take the tests in the, the numbers we need to do. And, you know, again, there's a vacuum there. Yeah, it's not really happening. There is uh, 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 a, a contrary or contrarian argument that people are making that we really should just accept the fact that some people are going to get sick uh, and get the economy moving again and, uh, you know, not worry a bit too much about the fact that people will be sick. And it seems to me that that's short sighted because it seems to me that if a lot of people get sick and hospitals are overwhelmed, and you have deaths in the like millions instead of the thousands that that has an effect on the economy too well yeah of course and, you know people you know you can't like open the broadway theaters and tell people to come if they're afraid that, that, that you know that they're going to be the among the people who are sacrificed in this you know i mean you know uh you know i, I live in a city where we lost you know three thousand people in 9-11 and people acted appropriately to say this is you know, a terrible disaster. We shouldn't let that happen again. And now we're talking about, you know, many, many more people like that. You know, and I'm, I'm a person, you know, I'm over 60 years old. Um, I, I, I don't want to die for the economy. Um, I don't want to lose my friends, the economy. And it's not just older people. We just lost, you know, um, you know, the one of the, you know, the, the you know, musicians of Fountains of Wayne, and we're losing, you know, younger people, um, you know, uh, as well. So I mean, it just, it's just ridiculous to say, uh, and immoral to say, you know, well, for the sake of the economy, let's lose a, a couple million lives. That affects everybody. And, um, and it's not going to help the economy to, you know, have people afraid that they're going to be among that cohort that, that dies from this. The governor of Texas uh, issued a proclamation to ban all gatherings greater than 10 persons and has, well, well he uh, accepted uh, religious gatherings just uh, yesterday, I believe it was, so because uh, all of the major metro areas in Texas had said, no, uh, churches need to live stream and not gather a bunch of people together and cause increased infection and the governor overruled that and said no uh, we don't uh, want to impede uh, religious freedom so now it's all in an uproar all the churches well, are, are some are saying well you know we'll go ahead and have big services and others are saying that's a bad idea well i mean i don't i think you know again and this is you know comes from reporting of largely my colleagues at, at wired and also other places you know that uh is that you know that this virus and this is what brilliant said you know this virus it, it is not really pick its you know uh its victims you know that it, it, it it's an equal opportunity uh killer and you know and 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 harm you know and does and gets you sick no matter who you are so um you know uh whether you whether you catch it in a in a, in a, in a church or a baseball game um, you're going to be sick and you might die. And that's what Brilliant was saying. And he was hoping that, you know, that's where the interview ends to say, maybe this is what we're going to learn from this, that, uh, you know, we're, that we're not different, that, you know, they were all together in this. And um, to make exceptions like that would seem to me to be going against that lesson that Brilliant was suggesting we take from that. Well, let's all hope that cooler heads and wiser heads will prevail. Certainly a lot of noise in the air about this thing. I guess I'm minimally hopeful that things will settle down and that people like Fauci and Larry Brilliant will will uh, have the day. Well, we, you know, <laughs> uh, we could get on our live streams and pray, I guess. Yeah, my fingers are all crossed right now. I'm just hopeful, or I try to be hopeful. Oh, great. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, John. Thanks, Scoop. I, I appreciate it. And uh, stay safe, guys. You can follow Stephen's continuing journalism adventures in the pages of Wired or at StephenLeeby.com. 
You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.